A changing of the guard in Washington and right here in Iowa. One already complete with now President Trump and in Iowa a new governor is waiting at the state house. We look behind the headlines with some of Iowa's best journalists on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Communications Network. The availability of high-speed broadband service is essential to fulfilling the promise of a connected Iowa. ICN's Broadband Matters campaign showcases the importance of delivering broadband to all corners of Iowa. Information is available at broadbandmatters.com. UIE Care is helping provide access to health care services to more Iowans. By offering online visits with the University of Iowa health care provider, UIE Care helps Iowans seek medical care without leaving home. Learn more at uiecare.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is the Friday, January 20 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. 730 days ago, presidential candidates started campaigning in Iowa ahead of our state's 2016 caucuses and ultimately the presidency. President Trump's inaugural address Friday makes, marks the beginning of a new chapter of governance. Here in Iowa, questions remain about the impact of a potential repeal of Obamacare and what a new Republican majority at the State House wants to do. And Governor Branstead prepares to leave for China, and Iowa's first female governor prepares to take office. Joining us to talk about it all, James Lynch of the Gazette in Cedar Rapids, Radio Iowa News Director Kay Henderson, the Des Moines Register's political columnist, Kathy Obradovich, and Lee Newspaper's Des Moines Bureau Chief, Aaron Murphy. Aaron, let's start off with you, but I want to go around the table to get everyone's reaction uh, to that inaugural speech that we just heard. Aaron. Well, to me, it felt uh, very similar to a lot of his campaign speeches. I was sitting there watching, and I almost pulled over my laptop and started filing a, a report for my papers. Felt like I was back on the campaign trail. Um, we heard a lot of... it. it it was, and from that standpoint, it was interesting because he didn't take the opportunity to talk much about uh, unity and bringing the country together. He talked about all the same things he did on the campaign trail, uh, immigration reform, trade deals, bringing manufacturing jobs back. He didn't use the phrase drain the swamp, but he talked about sending the power back to the people. It was very much in, in, in his campaign style. Uh, we've been waiting months and months and months for the so-called pivot, and even as president, Donald Trump remains the same Donald Trump we've seen from the start. Kathy, what's your take on that speech last time? You know, a lot of times an inaugural dress is kind of like a warm hug, you know, or, you know, a, a feel-good message to bring the country together. This was a punch in the kisser, uh, especially for the Washington establishment. Um, the people sitting behind him must have started feeling a little warm on a cold, rainy day uh, because uh, he was making things hot for them. Uh, also, I, I was struck by his message to the world. During Barack Obama's first inaugural address, he reached out. He said, uh, to poor countries, we will help you, um, you know, till your farms. We'll help you find clean water. Um, uh, rich countries like the United States need to step up. And, and Donald Trump was like, America first, baby. You know, this is going to be a, a protectionist agenda and, uh, and not something that, um, you know, we're going to be necessarily reaching out to other countries. And James? Your well, take I think, on this. I think like every president uh, in their inaugura inaugural address, they speak to their base. And Donald Trump really did that. Everything that Kathy said, I mean, that was what he said on the campaign trail. That was what his base wanted. They want to put America first. At the same time, there, there were a few lines in there that struck me as a, an attempt to be inclusive. He talked about, um, we're going to restore the promise for all people. Um, 
uh, their pain is our pain, their dreams are our dreams, their success is our success. There was this attempt to talk about how we're all in this together. Um, it was a small part of the speech, but uh, before he went into the punch and the kisser uh, to the rest of the world. I went okay. back and listened to the previous inaugural addresses from this century. So two Bush speeches, two Obama speeches. I was struck in Obama's first inaugural address. He said the question is not whether government is too big or too small, it's whether it works. It seems as if voters have said it's too big. That's the message that Trump uh, seems to have taken on board. And the chairman of the Iowa GOP told me it sounds like a president, when you listen to this speech, is somebody who's going to fulfill those campaign promises. The other thing that struck me was that much of the speech was about domestic policy, uh, as was Obama's 2009 speech, whereas that speech that George Bush gave in 2004 was mostly about America's role in the world. Uh, Trump didn't talk much about that. At one point, Bush in 2005 said, you know, we are tested, uh, but we're not weary. Uh, I think that uh, there's an energy and enthusiasm among Republicans in Congress because they have a Republican president. We have the same thing going on in Iowa. We have an energized Republican Party. And, uh, you know, the gun was sounded uh, when... Uh, Trump raised his hand and, and took the oath of office. Well, Kathy, just talk about Democrats here. I mean, some of that, somebody said it's morning in America, and there are two ways to spell that term. So <laughs> for some Democrats, they're morning. For Republicans, they're, it's morning for them, too. But, Kathy, so much of this speech really sounded like a Democrat could have given it, uh, that Bernie Sanders could say. You think... I wonder if Democrats thought he's speaking to our audience. There's the 80,000 votes that would have, in three states, that could have made this day much different. Well, I, I do, I can't imagine Bernie Stander, Sanders standing up and saying, um, the establishment's victories aren't our victories, and you know their triumphs aren't our triumphs. Um, that was definitely a, um, a, a, a similar theme of Washington not being part of the rest of the country. Um, and you know, I do think that um, you know, talking about how you know, starting you know this day in history will be the day that the American people take back their government. Um, definitely a populist, uh, very strongly populist tone um, from jo Donald Trump. You know, I, I think, though, as we go forward, um, we've, what we've already seen with Donald Trump is that his words um, are really a lot less important than what his actions are. And, and I think we're about to see, you know, are we, are we going to get that flood of executive orders, for example, um, which, you know, Republicans were very upset about Barack Obama's executive orders as being undemocratic. The other thing, you know, Iowa Democrats should look at the speech and say, what parts of the speech would I hear Tom Harkin giving? Uh, you know, rebuild the infrastructure, um, America first in terms of our working folks. I, I mean, Democrats in Iowa should look at the speech and say, what about this agenda did we miss? Did we not communicate to our people in Iowa if they want to rebuild their party from the grassroots and up. why did this resonate yeah, Aaron so how people? long will these Trump voters in Iowa uh, give the administration to produce I mean I remember during the campaign we'd all hear these, these people say I voted for Obama twice and mm -hmm. he didn't get anything and and so I voted for Trump so how long does Trump have to produce well, I mean, obviously, in general, he's got four years until he's on the ballot again. But uh, that, that will be the interesting thing to watch. And when you talk to Trump voters since the election, uh, many of them will tell you, I'm holding him to this. You know, I voted for him because we've lost jobs and he says he's going to bring them back. So we better see some jobs coming. James. We'll find out in 2018 <laughs> how, how many uh, congressional seats Republicans lose. Mm -hmm. That will be an indicator of how patient uh, voters are going to be. One other thing I wanted to mention. Some words we didn't hear in, in his inaugural address. We didn't hear rigged. We didn't hear crooked. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't hear lion. Uh, <laughs> so he could, he could have been a campaign speech. <laughs> right, right. And he could have been a lot harder on those people sitting back behind him and around him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tur let's turn it to closer to the Midwest and home. Last week, at the very end of the, uh, we got a, an appointment of agriculture secretary. 
Sonny Perdue, former governor of Georgia, is a veterinarian. Chuck Grassley's reaction was, Senator Grassley's reaction was, oh, is he, was he a cat? Is he a cat veterinarian? <laughs> uh, is, is this not going to over well with Midwestern lawmakers? Uh, privately, there's a little bit of angst because none of the cabinet picks that uh, Donald Trump has made come from the Midwest. Uh, Senator Grassley earlier in the week sort of famously tweeted, it would be nice to have an ag secretary from north of the Mason-Dixon line. After Purdue was chosen, uh, Grassley said, now that we have somebody in southern ag at the head of the helm in the USDA, it will be fun to see how the Midwest has a voice in this. Uh, so you now have people agitating for some of the deputy secretaries within the USDA to be Iowans, maybe even someone named Bill Northey, who is currently the state's ag secretary and is sort of facing a glass ceiling here in Iowa where he can't run for governor and he probably is not going to be Kim Reynolds' lieutenant governor, so that might be a next stop on his political uh, train. Uh, it's been fascinating to watch the reaction to this. The Iowa Renewable Fuels Association expressed um, some consternation about the lack of Midwestern representation. James, what do you uh, make of this appointment? Uh, does the Midwest have something to worry about that the, the Southerner seems to be running, making ag policy? Yeah, I think so. Uh, there, there's always this concern about southern crops are different than northern crops. We, we grow corn and beans. Down there they grow rice and sugar and, and cotton. And, and the commodity programs don't necessarily mesh. And there's always sort of this, if they win, we lose sort of attitude about the farm bill, which they're going to be in the process of writing another farm bill this year. So, yeah, there, there's some concern there. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, in Senator Grassley's statement, he said, you know, the appointment of some deputies um, like Bill Northey could help offset the southern influence of Sonny Perdue. So we'll have to see how that plays out. And, it, and it's interesting. You, you see you have leaders both in public office here in Iowa and in industries like the ethanol industry uh, who are worried about the RFS now placing their faith almost solely in Donald Trump uh, because of the things he promised them, even though he has now made appointments of people who may not have said, may have said things in the past that don't align, and I'm thinking specifically of, is it Pruitt uh, with the EPA? Oklahoma, um, Attorney uh, yeah, General. Yeah, and, and, and he is in the past. Rick Perry. And then Rick yeah, Perry. Rick Perry. They've had, they've in the past not been supportive of the RFS. So you have uh, like the um, um, Monty Shaw at the Renewable Fuels Association saying, I have to place my faith now in Donald Trump. He assured us that he will be a strong supporter of the RFS. Well, and beyond agriculture, the ag community has to be watching very closely about what Donald Trump is actually going to do on trade. There was a lot of speculation that one of those early executive orders would be, you know, no more TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, big Asian alliance that could be really very lucrative, especially for uh, hog producers in Iowa. So uh, it's not just it's not just renewable energy and it's not just uh, farm commodity. It, it's it's everything when it comes it's to It's NAFTA yeah. and CAFTA. He said he wants to renegotiate trade deals. Well, and I can see where that resonates with a lot of of the blue collar voters that Trump picked up this cycle. But, you know, maybe should they be careful what they wish for? I mean, is it in Iowa's interest to have a trade war with China? Where are we going to sell all this pork? Well, you know, if you're going to be a manufacturer in Iowa, um, you know, where are you going to get your parts from? If, if you know, the parts, you know, for your, your new auto plant that you're going to build uh, in Iowa or Missouri or wherever, um, if the parts are all still coming from Asia, uh, you're going to you're going to have to be paying a lot of money for those and it's going to be very difficult. So uh, I, I think that in t you've got a cart and a horse here and modernizing American manufacturing um, may need to come a little bit before the horse of a great big tariff from foreign foreign goods. Right. Well, to be continued. Kathy, I want to turn uh, to the state house now. Um, What's the Republican agenda? They got they they're the, the dog chasing the car now. And yeah, they you caught know, it. They've got the trifecta. They caught it. <laughs> uh, what, particularly in the Senate, what are they going to do? You know, I was struck uh, by how little of their own agenda that Republicans brought into the state house. We had a, a a conference with them right before a week before the legislature started, and um, really, it, it seemed to me like they were waiting on Terry Branstad to bring their agenda so that they would have something to react to. Um, 
Um, beyond that, the the House uh, was talking about, well, we sent over all of these bills uh, to the Senate that got stalled the last couple of years. You know, we're, we're going to go back to those. Um, and then Senate Republican leadership, really what they want to do is do a big tax cut, and we don't have the money for that right now. So they're kind of stalled in, the, in what I think was probably their number one goal. I honestly think that this is going to be a, a situation where the legislature is mostly reacting to what Governor Brand said is laid out. James, is the legislature having trouble getting off to a fast start? I mean, what we're hearing coming out, we're not hearing about how they're going to balance the budget. We're hearing about bills to legalize machine guns. Uh, exactly. What, you know, what, what, who's setting what agenda here? Well, I, I think it's, it's a case of where if there aren't big things dominating the session, then you have time to write bills about legalizing machine guns and banning traffic uh, enforcement devices and uh, those sorts of things. And so we're seeing a whole lot of those bills being introduced in the Senate and finally some in the House. Um, while the leaders and the Appropriations Committee chairs are trying to figure out how to cut the current year budget by somewhere around 110 to 130 million dollars and everybody else is sitting there and as one legislator said the other day it feels like the end of the session where you're waiting for a deal to be struck and somebody to tell us what to do well where do they get a hundred million dollars out of this budget well the governor <laughs> gave them a, a quite a challenge because he took about three-quarters of the budget off the table. He I'm took sure they were happy about that. Right, and, and some some of the legislators are not happy about that, that, you know, when you have to come up with a budget cut and, you know, three quarters of the budget is off the table, it makes it harder. So there are some lawmakers who want to protect uh, the court's budget uh, and keep the courthouse back in their county open all the time. Uh, they want to keep troopers on the road. Um, so they're looking for some alternatives. It sounds like they're going to honor the, the uh, governor's proposal to pay back the property tax backfill to cities and counties. Um, but that was one that they discussed. They might not uh, stick with him on that. Uh, I, I heard somebody say, you know, it'd be easier to cut $10 million from the K-12 funding. It would be a drop in the bucket compared to cutting eight, nine million from community colleges. So you have those sorts of arguments going on, and there seem to be some lines being formed in the Republican caucuses in the House and in the Senate. Um, perhaps the best assessment I've gotten so far is asking Appropriations Chairman uh, Representative Pat Grassley if we should be seeing white smoke or black smoke, <laughs> and he uh, said gray smoke. <laughs> Aaron, uh, uh, the Majority Leader Bill Dix in the Senate said, was quoted as saying, we're going to kick in the doors. <laughs> uh, it's a very populist thing. Um, so t tell me, where, uh, what doors are going to get kicked in here first? Well, and that, to, to what Kathy was talking about, the, they, the, this group has been in the minority for a long time, and, and they finally have their chance to run bills that are going to get passed in their own chamber, much less uh, all the way to the governor's desk, which they haven't been able to do in, in recent years. Um, tax policy, as Kathy said, was right at the top of their uh, list, their wish list. That's going to be really difficult to do unless it's something that um, kicks in in later years when the budget has a little more room for something like that. It'll be interesting to see what kind of proposal they put together because that's something they really wanted to do. But then we've seen, uh, you know, the, the other big ticket thing right from the start is defunding Planned Parenthood. Uh, clinics that perform abortions. That's one that uh, they've been wanting to do for years and they've begun to set the wheels in motion on that uh, and, and get that in the budget. Um, but we'll see any number of things. Um, banning um, use of handheld use of phone while driving is one that's uh, on the front burner in the Senate and I think the House is actually working on them on that one too. Kathy, on this budget, is that something that they could just punt? I mean, the projections are the budget gets better down the next year. Uh, do they have to cut anything? Do they really feel they have I, to be I cutting? I think that the Republicans have to make a statement. Um, and that statement is that we're going to have smaller government. Um, we may not, they may not agree on uh, difficult cuts that come halfway through the fiscal year. Uh, but, but I would expect that, you know, the governor's budget that he has rolled out for the next two years are, is going to be coming to his desk or her desk, depending on who is sitting there, smaller than what uh, was rolled out uh, here this month. Um, I, I really do think that Republicans are going to um, want to send a message that, that we are here for, to have a smaller government. Well, and there's a tactical reason that you do that if you're a budget maker. If you shrink the state government, that means next year, in an election year, you have more money in which to hand back to Iowans in the form of a tax cut. So you do the tough stuff 
right. this year. You make Correct. people mad, they'll forget about it by next year and you'll be able to. You think that's a, what you expect the Republicans to be doing this, this cycle? Uh, th internally, that's what they tell you that they're aiming to do, is to, is to dr dramatically reduce the governor's proposed budget so that they have room to do at least an across-the-board cut in income taxes. Back to uh, kicking in the doors. I mean, anybody <laughs> else got any other doors they see the, the Republican boot going into? Uh, what's interesting to me is that this uh, de-appropriations bill that deals with the current year's budget that would reduce uh, spending uh, up to $130 million, that there hasn't been discussion about putting defunding Planned Parenthood in that, because that was one of the four issues that the new Republican leader, Bill Dick, said was a priority number one uh, for uh, Senate Republicans was to defund Planned Parenthood. So I would suspect that there may be an effort to put defunding Planned Parenthood in that bill so that not only do they cut the budget, which they promised uh, voters they will do, but they will also defund Planned I, Parenthood. I think the boot will also be going through the door of organized labor um, starting this year. The governor came forth with a proposal saying he wanted to take health care out of collective bargaining. Um, that is uh, going to be very controversial. It would be one of the main uh, points of opposition, I think, from Democrats that they are going to try to protect collective bargaining. I would I think that the governor's proposal is just the start. I, I think that um, that there are going to be some Republican legislators who are looking to wholesale rewrite um, the section of code that deals with collective bargaining and, and what is uh, paid to public employees. Where, uh, James, there's a, there's a learning curve in, among Senate Republicans, uh, isn't there? Um, they, they... Yeah, I mean, that's the election turned the Senate upside down. You have... Uh, you know, about half the Democratic caucus that have never served in the minority. And there's only a couple of Senate Republicans who have been in the Senate majority uh, in their time in the Senate. Bill, Bill Dick served in the majority in the House, but not in the Senate. You have uh, Jerry Bain, who's been there quite some time. Uh, Brad Zahn, who was there when they were tied back in uh, 2005 and six um, and shared control. But beyond that, uh, well, David Johnson was there <laughs> as a majority Republican, but uh, he's not a Republican anymore. So there is this learning curve that they're the ones who have to put the car in gear. They're the ones who have to make the process work. Uh, you know, for the past several years, they've been the loyal opposition. And, and I'm not sure everybody has made the transition yet. Well, let's talk a little bit about this uh, balance inside the Republican Party. It's true nationally. It's true uh, in Iowa. You've alluded to it. I mean, how do they keep the constituencies that got them there happy without alienating a whole lot of other voters on issues like abortion, on labor rights, on issue, Second Amendment <clears throat> issues. Um, you think they'll be able to find a sweet spot? Uh, you look at the trouble, I mean, here's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, Wisconsin took on organized labor and they it, it had a civil war in the state. Uh, well, uh, in in uh, North Carolina, uh, Pat McCrory is no longer governor. Be you know, what about Iowa, okay? I mean, well, I mean, we can look to recent history in Iowa to see where the seeds of dissension within a party were sowed because people overreached. Uh, Chuck Culver was governor. Democrats were in control of both the House and the Senate at the State House, and they passed a pro-labor bill that was a step too far for a Democratic governor. And that sowed the seeds uh, for of dissension in 2010 when that governor, Chet Culver, sought re-election. He didn't win re-election because union voters and, and working uh, class voters in the Democratic Party were not energized because of that very veto. That sort of thing can happen. If they don't go as far as their conservative voters want them to, there will be a backlash. If um, they, they do... Uh, uh, pursue that agenda, there's going to be a backlash. This is a really, uh, how, you know, hard uh, line to toe. Here. And, and how severe that backlash will depend in part on whether Democrats are getting themselves together in time to, uh, uh, to really capitalize on it. 2018 seems like a long way away, but it really isn't when you've got no candidates. Um, you know, we just had uh, one of the, the great hopes uh, to run for governor in 2018, Senator Liz Mathis, say, ah, not me, not me. And uh, there's, I think that, it, you know, we're going to have to see very soon who the leaders are of the Democratic Party stepping up to get their party ready to capitalize on what is going to be inevitably some mistakes and overreaches on the part of the Republicans. Aaron, uh, 
What about this going too far? Um, you know, in Kansas, when the, the, the governor there cut tax, they cut taxes so bad that the state's running a big deficit. Uh, it's, it's backfired on the Republicans there. So are Kansas, North Carolina, Wisconsin, even Indiana uh, lost athletic conferences uh, be, because of gay rights legislation. Where do you think this is going to come out? The, there are examples out there, and, and to be uh, fair, um, some of the current Iowa leaders have said we've, we've watched other states and we're trying to use those examples. This is going to be interesting because it really comes down on leadership. The rank and file are going to file every bill they want to do, every bill they've been dreaming of doing forever. So it falls on Linda Upmeyer and Bill Dix and then Terry Branstad or Kim Reynolds, depending on who's on in the governor's office. They're the ones that will ultimately decide which of these legislations really pieces of legislation really get a hearing and get to the desk and what gets out there for the public. So this is the challenge they face. And I talked to leaders back when uh, Republicans also controlled the Iowa State House in 97, 98, and they all said that it, these leaders are really going to be tested. It's up to yeah. them. James, we've only got a minute left, and I want to ask you about the governor's uh, emb embassy appointment. When's that going to happen? Is he going to, uh, well, I mean, when does Kim Reynolds, question. does she just... Kim Reynolds uh, told us the other day she expects it in February or March. There's nothing definite about that. Uh, we assume the transition will take place sometime during the legislative session, but Governor Branstad might be here for the entire session. That might be a good pol politically for Kim Reynolds not to have to take responsibility for anything that goes wrong during the session, uh, and, but be there to take credit for anything that goes right. It'll also be good for Kim Reynolds to have Terry Branstad on another continent because uh, he won't be able to weigh in on anything. He will be <laughs> occupied with another um, occupation at the time. Right. Well, she's going to have to make, her, make the office her own in some way, and whatever way she chooses, um, if it's different from what Terry Branson would have done, it's going to be probably controversial. Um, but yes. it, it would help her if she had a whole session to, to get used to the idea. We've got to leave it there. Lots to talk about, lots more to talk about uh, later. Thank you all very much for being here. We'll return next week with another edition of Iowa Press. Our guest will be Board of Regents President Bruce Rastetter. Mr. Rastetter has faced numerous challenges during his tenure, and his current term expires at the end of April. Regents President Bruce Rastetter on the next edition of Iowa Press. Well, for all of us at Iowa Public Television, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Communications Network. The availability of high-speed broadband service is essential to fulfilling the promise of a connected Iowa. ICN's Broadband Matters campaign showcases the importance of delivering broadband to all corners of Iowa. Information is available at broadbandmatters.com. UIE Care is helping provide access to health care services to more Iowans. By offering online visits with a University of Iowa health care provider, UIE Care helps Iowans seek medical care without leaving home. Learn more at uiecare.com.